we're talking to none other than Arsenal legend Lee Dixon today on behalf of bettingsites.co.uk. And um, yeah, so let's just kick off with the fact that uh, Mikel Arteta's gunners are, are taking the lead by storm, looked great on Sunday. Would you yeah. say that performance against Fulham was their most dominant of the season so far? Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a I say it's a funny season. It's been a, and it's been a good season because I think with a team that's not won the league before um, for well, for a while, certainly this group of players, apart from Zinchenko and Jesus, you know that it's all new to them. So I think during the season, it's good to have different types of performances, different types of victories. Uh, the odd upset, the odd uh, down moment, a period of time where the team's not performing particularly well but still winning, then a, a period where you you do lose a couple of games or you have a feeling that you're not playing top form because all of that goes towards building a, um, a, a history that you can look back on or, or rely on on those experiences as you get towards the end the very pointed end of a season where you're going for the league. Mm. And I think this season has been like that for Arsenal. A lot, a huge amount has gotten right for them. They've been absolutely exceptional from, you know, the goalkeeper right through to the, uh, to the, to all the subs on the bench. They've all played their part. Um, and I think that can only hold them in good stead. And one of those results was obviously um, at the weekend against Fulham, where they were, they, they totally dominated um, very forceful performance, very poor performance from Fulham. I might add to that. I, I went to the Brentford game, Brentford Fulham on the Monday, and they didn't play particularly well that night either. So there were signs that um, that the team wasn't performing too well. But a lot of teams, you know, get the performances up to a different level when you're playing against Arsenal, and they didn't allow that to happen. And that was the impressive thing for me at the weekend. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, obviously, you mentioned the defence and the goalkeeper there. Arsenal putting together clean sheet after clean sheet at the moment. I think that's <laughs> nine clean sheets away from home. Which players do you feel deserve the most credit for the stability that Arsenal are showing defensively? Well, I think, you know, the the obvious ones are the two centre-backs because they've there's been a problem area for quite a while previous to these two coming in. Um, I think that the the way they've handled Saliba in, in, a, in the uh, preparation for him to take in a position that looks like he's going to be there for years to come has been brilliant, you know, sending him out on loan and doing the, you know, not listening to the noise, um, mm. which is really important um, for a football club point of view, not listening to the outside agenda of, of media and people uh, giving their opinion about what they should do. They had a, a set... Um, a set kind of pathway for certain players and they've stuck to that and they're reaping the benefits of that. And I've always, you know, you very rarely pick out individuals as far as a defence is concerned because I, I certainly played in, wasn't the strongest fullback um, in the world individually, but in the collective that we formed, you know, became a very uh, efficient, effective um, member of a, of a four that, you know, the sum of the parts was that was the strength of it, and I think that again, if you look at the partnerships on the pitch, um, it's really important. Anywhere else on the pitch, you can get away with playing off the cuff a little bit because your partnership can be a little bit loose because you you're just relying on a bit of flair, something to happen to make things happen at the other end of the pitch. Mm -hmm. Defensively, you've got to be a lot more structured in those relationships between centre-backs and your two full-backs, but also the midfield player in front of those individual departments are, are really important. And um, and I think Partey's positional play in front of the two centre-halves has, has really helped um, put them in a, a very stable place where they can um, play from there without having to worry about too much um, about stepping in and, and having to pick a number 10 up because party does a really good job at, um, at kind of sweeping up in front of them. Um, so the partnership again with the center backs on the, on the either side with the full backs has been really important as well. So, um, and with Shinchenko being that kind of floating um 
fullback that we've seen through Pep and now with other teams that are starting to do it. He he plays in a in a role that really complements what's um what's around him. And and I, I, I Jacques is a big part of that because he can play that left-sided, left back position anyway. It, it enables a lot of interaction and a lot of movement from him into midfield and it allows that space to be covered both by Gabriel and and, and Jacques. So uh, an all-round defensive team uh, performance and not no individuals the back four but certainly the protection in front of that and it starts from the top as well their mm. their pressing and their connected lines it has been very impressive and that takes a huge amount of time and effort on the training ground so all the credit has to go obviously to the coaching staff but uh, the players have also got to buy into that which it looks like they have done certainly does at the moment everything's going smoothly um Saliba got a mention there obviously uh, I think he's in negotiations to sign a new contract at the moment. Hopefully that goes to plan. Yeah. Amazing that he's only 21 years old, really. If you look back at some of the some of the centre backs that have gone on to do great things, Virgil van Dijk, Thiago Silva, at that age, they weren't anywhere near kind of playing at the top of the Premier League. How mm-hmm. high do you think William Saliba's ceiling is in comparison to some of the, say, Virgil van Dijk? Well, it's always it's always difficult to compare players because the mm. you know it's not just about what you see you know um on the pitch at times there's a lot of mentality going on and and the uh, you know I don't know him as a person so it's I don't know Van Dyke as a person but you you've we've seen enough of him to know what type of character he is and how mentally strong he is and what his weaknesses are and with Saliba because as you said he's so young he's had some good um, education away from the club, which, which we've talked about. Um, and at the moment, if you take the, the age away from it, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really be able to guess his age because of his, um, his impressive positional play he still makes the odd mistake um, and positionally sometimes. Uh, but that's, you know, compared to, as you said, other, other really top class centre backs, He's up there with them at the moment at such a tender age, so he can only get better. Um, he can only, look, you know, that that position is, you don't learn that overnight. You get some freak kind of uh, youngsters who are, are able to smell danger and be in the right position at the right time. Tony Adams was one of them. John Terry was in another one that that was kind of very good, very young, and there, uh, and certainly Saliba is hugely fits into that category and uh, you can't see really that partnership um, being split up for quite a few years. If if they choose that they want to stay at Arsenal and the club's successful, then it's a real solid base to, to play from. Huge asset for the club at the moment, yeah, you have to say. Um, with Gabriel, obviously, he's impressed as well, scoring goals from set pieces like he did against Fulham. He's arguably, arguably got a harder job than Saliba because when Zinchenko goes roaming into midfield, he has to cover that side of the pitch. Mm-hmm. Would you would you say he's been better than Saliba because of that, or just no? I don't. I don't. I don't. They play different. They play a different style. Um, certainly, when you say it's a bit more difficult, it's also a lot easier because you've got you've got an absolute an absolute brilliant footballer standing ten yards away from you. Either either outside you on the left or standing in front of you, who's moved into a position that makes it very difficult for the players to mark him. So, from a ball playing point of view, he's got an an added uh, option than maybe more so than Saliba has at times because he hasn't got that player who's who's wandering and drifting into that. He does actually drift over to the right sometimes, but predominantly on that left hand side he just br- brings himself in and and jack has been playing that that drifting left back role for for quite a long time now um certainly when tierney was playing as well tierney was going more so down the wing um as opposed to coming inside like zinchenko does but jacker always used to do that covering he's played left back as well um you know a, a, a number 3 when we've needed him over the last few seasons so He's adept at that. He's a great passer of the ball. I think Gabriel in that position is it's almost like we've got two different styles of 
how the centre backs play on the left and the right, which is which is difficult to play against because they come out a different they come out a different way on the left than they do on the right. So when you're a, a team trying to stop that happening, you've almost got to split your how your press is because it's a it's a different type of uh, movement. You've got to be linked in a different way. So um, I think it causes certainly the the first line of defence for other teams' problems because they don't come out the same way every time. Yeah, it's true. I mean, obviously the goals, there was a, there was a point in the season where Arsenal were kind of struggling for goals. Now that's not happening three against Fulham in the first half. Gabriel Martinelli's looking pretty potent up front. He's, he's being played on the left through the middle. Uh, in recent weeks, though, Bukayo Saka hasn't been scoring as freely as he was previously. Yeah. Made a lot more minutes than everyone else in the team. Do you think he needs a rest? Um, possibly at some point. Um, he's one of those players. He's one of those rare players. He's a bit like Ray Parler in that in that respect. When I who played in front of me, mm -hmm. um, didn't really miss a training session. Never really missed a game. Was always fit. Never got injured. Uh, always give hundred percent. Always got a a huge amount of kilometres out of him, a huge amount of sprints and never, you know, he seemed to be on Duracell batteries all the time. And I used to look at Ray and say, you know, what are you, are you taking something I'm, I should, <laughs> I should be taking from a vitamin point of view? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, of um, and, and Pacayo is the same and, and the level of performances, yeah, Ray's performances dipped uh, sometimes, but it was, you, you st he still warranted a place in the team because, mm a dipped for performance from him energy wise and and kilometer wise was probably about the average of all the other players and Bakayo's the same sometimes you know if his level of um productivity just drops a little bit he still warrants playing in that position because he does an awful lot for Ben White as well he does a lot of uh protection like Ray did for me I always say that um, you know, I kept Ray going, but it was definitely the other way around. You know, he protected me and I was mm -hmm. I was at a ripe old age. I knew the position and I knew where I should be. And so I tried to uh, limit the amount of running towards the end of my career. And, and Ray aided that. And I'm sure uh, Ben's not of that age, but I'm sure there's a lot of times where, you know, he's thankful that the quiet Saka in front of him um, is still playing there. So, but... Um, Mikel will be monitoring it with the fitness coaches and the physios and all their numbers and data they get now they'll they'll be looking at and I'm pretty sure once he, he starts to touch into his red zone which is probably miles different than anyone else's they'll be wary of that but he, he's such he's such an asset to the team you don't want to miss him through injury well, but it. he's also yeah. got he's also got so much um, going for him as far as physicality that you kind of you want to keep pushing him because you know he's so valuable. So um, th they'll be monitoring him. Don't worry about that. It'll be a very, very um, tight ship. They're running as far as um, overcooking the players. But you know what? 11 games to go. He can, have a, he can have a big rest in the summer and put his feet up. There's no tournament. Um, so he, he can have a nice rest in the summer with his league championship medal around his neck it makes yes. makes the summer go uh go a lot sweeter when you've got one of them dangling around your neck yeah 100 percent. and it's credit to him the amount he gets kicked by defenders that he hasn't really missed any games so you yeah. have to have to big he's him a tough up boy that. you know he's, he's a yeah. tough boy he's straight out of west london like me <laughs> <That's around the laughs> corner. um obviously with his the style that he plays with he's he's got a lot of strings to his bow mm. is there anyone that he reminds you of from um, Arsenal's sort of 90s era? Um, it's hard to make comparisons, obviously, but he, he's just, he's got a lot going. Yeah, because he's, I mean, he's not, you know, he's not one of those wide players. He's not really, you know, he's not, he's not, I say he's not got a trick. He's got, you know, he runs beautifully with the ball. I think that's his biggest asset. Mm. The way that he's, it, the, his body moves when he's running, some players are run, are run the quite stiff in their upper body and it's more of a an, an athlete's run. He, he's he got a silkiness about him that from a defensive point of view, when you're, I, I think Martinelli on the other side, he's a little bit more athletic as, as much as he looks like a, a, he looks like he's sprinting. Yeah. Marco with Bikayo, Bikayo, yeah. Kind of, yeah. With Bikayo, you don't, 
he doesn't look as if he's sprinting because he's got a very languid style about his body and he's very fluid. He's and that's, yeah. yeah, and that's that's harder to play against because um, as a defender, you kind of get lulled into a, a false sense that he's not actually running that quick. Mm-hmm. So when you go and engage him, you can be fooled into thinking, right, he's going to get up to speed in a minute. And he's actually running very fast when he gets to you. Yeah. So, and the, the fact he can just drop his shoulder really easily and in a very silky way um, un, unsettles the balance of a, of a, of a full back. So I think that's why he appears sometimes just to kind of walk past players mm-hmm. and, let me tell you, he's not walking. He's he's actually moving very quickly, and so that's his probably his biggest asset. I would have said um, his ability to run with the ball and look as if he's walking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it must be a surprise to defenders when they come up against him for the first time, for sure. Yeah. Um, someone that Arsenal signed in January, Leonardo, Leandro Trossard. Yeah. He kind of didn't really take any time at all to embed himself into the team, and on on Sunday looked great. How important can he be in the in the run-in for the title race, considering that Gabriel Jesus is only just back? It's probably not fit enough to start. So Fossard in that number nine, false nine role. Bruce I think he's a, I think he's a brilliant signing. I've always liked him at, at Brighton. Um, and the fact that he's he's playing in, in the Premier League and to be able to bring it uh, in a very good Brighton side. It's not like the, he's come from a team that's struggling that you you know, he, he then comes into a team that's going for the league and it can be a bit of a shock to him. He, he knows how to win games. He's been in a in a winning team that knows the process of getting results. So I think that was a big plus. He's not had to settle down and understand the Premier League if he'd come mm-hmm. from abroad. Um, relatively inexpensive, if you like, from a, <laughs> whatever that means these days. But, um, uh, and he, he, he looked like he was, he would, if you, if he came to to Arsenal, he was always going to just fit in at some point and you wouldn't really notice he hadn't been there for ages. And that's exactly what's happened. I think he's uh, the epitome, really, of a of an Arteta player in as much as, you know, his, his work rate, his understanding, his intelligence, his ability to just be able to fit in and play in numerous positions is something that, you know, with Martinelli, you've got, somebody who can play right, left, down the middle. You know, you, I'm pretty sure you can play Saka down the middle if you needed it to. Um, we've, and they've got options. Um, they've got options in, in other areas. So I think he's an absolutely brilliant signing and one that, if he's not already, he'll contribute a huge amount more before the last 11 games of the season. Yeah, I agree entirely. Obviously, he wasn't first choice. Everyone knows that. Um, Arsenal went for Mikhailo Mudrik, but were outbid by Chelsea. Now, he's someone who doesn't wasn't ready to go straight into the team. So do you think it's actually worked out as a blessing in disguise that Chelsea kind of swiped M- Mudrik? Yeah, I mean, you, we'll never know that. I mean, might go Mudrik, might go on and be, you know, Chelsea's player of the year for the next 10 years. You don't know. Mm-hmm. He's, he's obviously a huge talent. It, it was a a massive amount of money and there was a, an element of um, gamble with it, like there is with all big transfers, um, Pepe being a, a big example of that, yeah. how much they spent for him and how that's not worked. Um, but, you know, you, you if you, I think it's important, certainly from the manager, you know, the, the setup, sporting director, chief exec, manager, coaches, scouts, that if you don't, if you don't manage to land on the target, that you quickly put that to one side. And I'm, I'm sure irrelevant of how he does at Chelsea, and he, he's certainly a, a huge talent. Um, I think you've got to see, look at what you've got instead and go, actually, at the moment, um, you you would say that Trossard's having a bigger impact for Arsenal than Mudrick is for Chelsea. So, um and that's and that's a, a real loose way of of comparing, but um, I, I'm certainly not lying awake at night going, "We've lost out on Mudrick and we've only got Trossard for sure." I'm sure no, everybody else is thinking the 100%. same. Yeah, even um, Jorginho has proved to be a, an astute signing as well. So, yeah. in, in the middle of the park, obviously Arsenal's captain at the moment, Martin Odegaard. Few eyebrows might have been raised when Arteta gave him the armband. Different type of captain to the to Tony Adams in your day. 
But yeah. how impressed have you been with with his leadership credentials, Odegaard? Yeah, I mean, th- there's different types of captain. I was always, you know, I'm, I'm quite old school in as much as my captains were always were always the Tony Adams type, um, and I it was then passed on to to Patrick Vieira, who's of a similar type of um, dominating type of of personality and, and Thierry Henry um, mm. slightly different than Tony but still the mentality of a winner and 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 I think that's probably where it falls down uh, in the, in the same feeling it's about the mentality of 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 winning basically and uh, and I think I don't know I've met Martin a few times here and there he's a, he's a very kind of um, shy is probably not the right word but quiet in as much as um, he doesn't, I mean, he knows who I am, but he's not like, you know, we're not mates or anything. We've only met at functions. In fact, I presented him with his London Football Award last night, player of the season. Um, and we, you know, we had a quick chat and um, shook hands and what have you. But he's got, a, he's got a presence about him that's still such a young age, I think, because he's been around for a million years. Yeah. And been playing, at, you know, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Been playing yeah. since he was like, at Real Madrid since he was three or something. Yeah, just yeah. <laughs> signed when he was five years of age. Um, but he's, yeah, he's, I think certainly Mikel, I think, highlighted early on that he, he potential had um, to be a, a captain because of his influence. And that's what captains need to do. They need to, to, to have an influence on the players around them, however that is, whether it's verbal, whether it's by their own performance or whether it's by dragging a team with a with creative spirit like Thierry Henry, the, a different type of captain and, and him being the same because he's he's so iconic in this Arsenal team now, the way he plays and the position he plays. Everything goes through him. So in that respect, he's, he's, he's a born leader for this team. Yeah, totally agree. Um, obviously, Gabriel Jesus out for a long time since the World Cup. Got a big reception from the Arsenal fans when he came on against Fulham. I uh, did miss the one-on-one, perhaps not the most clinical of strikers. Do you think Arteta should be concerned about his... He hasn't exactly got ice running through his veins in a kind of Eduardo style of finisher. Should that be a concern yeah. to Arteta? No, I, I don't agree with you, actually. I think he has got... I think he is a cool... I think he's very cool. Mm. I don't think he... I don't think he's... He's hugely experienced. Um, mm. I think he's... Uh, on his day, I think he probably gives more. Certainly, I think he's valued more in the in the team than he is from from outside. Um, and I think all the players, he, he gets he gets into positions that that enables other players to be able to to go into other positions that they wouldn't do if he was there. So he complements the team brilliantly well. I think yeah. Arteta will, will look at that. You know the, the forward position. Obviously, Nketiah has come in and taken his chance brilliantly, and and suffered a little bit with an injury. But other than that, I think he's done brilliantly well. But I think it's definitely an area that in the summer they they will look to. You know, Jesus and, and Nketiah moving forward. If they were to go, ir- irrespective of whether they win the league or not, it's I think it's an area of the pitch that they'll they'll look to um, to improve again. Um, and that's not that's not to say that Nketiah and, and Jesus are, are doing or will do a, a poor job as far as scoring goals next season. I just think you need you you need at least three strikers that are, are in a position to play every week, and certainly um, any injury to either one of them, and they're they're back in the whether Trossard plays as a false nine or or anybody else, they still goals are the hardest thing to get, so. Mm-hmm. They'll be looking at that closely in the summer. Speaking of goals, someone who is obviously on Arsenal's books, but out on loan um, following Balogun, mm. banging him in, in League One. Um, he's been speaking. I'm not sure what the plan is. What would you would you be looking to bring him back and integrate him into the team or cash in while his stock is high? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one because there's a reason why he's gone out on loan, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to get some games, to, to improve him as a player. Only you know the, you know Edu, Vinay and and Mikel and his staff will kind of know what the true answer to that is. Um, and as you said, 
there's a huge difference between the Premier League and, and the league he's playing in. And, and I mean huge. So you, we can't be, I'm saying we can't be filled. He's doing brilliantly well. And he's got to be in position and he's got to take the goals and score the goals. And the quality of the defending, the quality of the matches that he's playing in is, you know, it, it's a huge difference to where um, he holds his registration, which is at, at Arsenal. So they might have already made that decision. Um, and the fact that he's, it's a, it's a, an added bonus now. The fact that he's scoring the goals, and they might just, as you said, that much push his price up, and then they cash in on him. I'd be surprised if he came back and 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 but Enketia, That's exactly what they did with Enketia. Yeah. Um, He was out on loan seemingly forever, and and come back and taking his chance. So never say never. But he's he's certainly hitting some headlines at the moment. Do you feel um, with the the second leg against Sporting Lisbon coming up on Thursday, what's that, day after tomorrow, that rotation is key for that one. He, Arteta, I think, made five changes for the first leg. Obviously, yeah. you've got Palace at the weekend as well who aren't in great form. Would Should he just focus on winning game after game after game, not make too many changes? Well, it, it's easy for us to sit here and say that. We, we're not in training every day. We're not. I think that's the key to it is he's with the players day in day out and he can see what's going on in in training they'll be getting data from all the sports scientists about training data and and how they're recovering etc so these days it's it's not a visual thing from making decisions about players there's there's a huge amount that goes into it um i think he will make some changes and he certainly won't i know you mentioned the the form of palace but any premier league game at the moment and in fact, ever, um, when you look at, if you were looking at the opposition at the weekend and going, oh, we've got Palace, so we can make a few changes because they won't be that good, is a very dangerous yeah. place to go, especially with Man City chasing down, you know, breathing down your neck. Mm -hmm. So um, he'll be looking at Palace going, they haven't won in 2023. They're going to win a game at some point. This is a really dangerous game. So that might just force his hand a little bit this midweek, he'll, he'll be looking and say, so we certainly said anyway, but when I watched the game, that they can play an awful lot better than they did last week against them. And the Sporting have got a bit of pace, have got a bit... But it's a game that they should win and they, sh they should possibly win it with making a few changes. So um, that's why he gets paid the big bucks to make mm. decisions like that. Make those calls, that's true. Obviously, he's following on in the footsteps from... Um... Arsene Wenger to an extent kind of feels like this team could be on the same trajectory. I have to ask the Invincibles question. Do you feel this team has the potential to, to match the Invincibles? No. No. Next fair, question. Fair enough. <laughs> it's, it's dangerous comparison, isn't it, I suppose. But let's I just think say. I think well the far the way off it at the moment. They've, yeah. they've lost they've lost games and, and they'll continue to lose games. I think. That that's just the nature of this Premier League at the moment. I think the invincible season was um, was an incredible feat, and uh, and I said at the time, I'd be very very surprised if that happens again. Uh, and certainly, this team has got uh, potential to to put a really long run together. But I think you know to go a whole season would is is beyond them at the moment. Um, they've still got a lot of development to do. Oh, yeah, it's true. I mean, Man City haven't even done it. No one else has done it. So that's what you see. But um, are you back in Arsenal to win the title, though? Um, am I backing them to win the title? I mean, if you were yeah. if you were a betting man and you looked at and you looked at where they are, um, you would go, well, hang on a minute, they could be eight points clear in you know after the weekend and then or you know after Arsenal's next game. So and that's a huge amount, and City have got to do this, this, and this. But I still think, having been having having been in many a title running and and lost, you know, lost them as well as won them. Yeah. Um, I know what goes on within that last sort of seven games of the season, and it's terrifying. You know, that last running bit is it's really scary. It's really scary if you're in the lead. Not mm -hmm. quite as scary if you're chasing because you you know there's no the pressures are eased off you a bit. But as soon as you catch a team, and then the pressure but gets piled on overnight. You know you you're chasing. We were chasing United 
I, I remember in 98 and we were 13 points behind and with three games in hand or what, and we played them at Old Trafford and we we won that game, which enabled us to actually catch them with our games in hand. And so the next few games, the pressure just went off because yeah. up until that point, nobody thought we could do it. And then all of a sudden we were in the dressing room after the game, we beat United 1-0 and we knew because you could see the fear in there. They were like, oh, hang on a minute. This is it, the, the tide had turned like that. And then the pressure gets piled on um, and, and it's not easy to deal with. Um, and having won it before, you kind of you've got some sort of as I talked to you a bit about the history of performances, you've got something to to fall back on and go, oh, this is what happened last time. This is how I felt then. This is how I got through the next few games. This is what happened. And you've got a history to and sometimes that history is bad history because you didn't do the things that you thought you would do at the time and you 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 didn't perform like you should have done. So. There's still a huge, they've got to go to Newcastle away, Man City away, Liverpool away. And that's, forget about the other game, the eight, eight games they've got to play, yeah. where some of those teams, Palace being one of them, are fighting for their lives. Um, so there's a, there's an awful lot to happen. So the, the short answer to your question is, um, if I had to put a bet on, I would probably still stick with Arsenal, and that's my heart and my head. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge part of my head knowing what's coming for this team and they've jumped over all the hurdles so far, stumbled a bit here and there, but then got back on the horse and that's really admirable. But the last seven, six to seven games are terrifying. Yeah, I think I, think I can only imagine, but I think you're right. The, the game's going to Anfield, going to the City Stadium and then going to Newcastle. I think those are the, the crucial three really, aren't they? But... um. Obviously, we've got the international break coming up next week. Do you feel that's coming at a bad time for Arsenal in terms of the momentum that you build up? Uh, li listen, it's a bad time if if you have a weekend off and the following weekend you get beat. Mm. It's a good time if the opposite happens and you win the game. You go, at least we've had a rest and we've been able to do some training. It it. There's a million teams that have lost after international break and there's a million teams that have won. And for all the reasons, because we we talk ourselves into you asking me the question, is the momentum, is it a bad time because they've got a momentum? And mm -hmm. it, and in and ha, in hindsight is the only way you could ever answer that because mm -hmm. sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I've had times off where we go, do you know what? Oh, it's great to have a break because we're not playing particularly well and you do a load of work in training and then the following week you come back and you're raring to go and you get beat and you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. No and so it's, yeah. it's, it's basically chit chat amongst us. I'm not, I'm not saying that was a bad question. I'm saying it's chit chat amongst what we do is to yeah. speculate and to try and make some sense of what's going on. Yeah. Um, but it's, so, it, it, it could be, it could be either or, it, it, sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad I think the important thing the the good thing about it having a break is at this stage in the season and maybe it, towards the end a little bit more you've got a few niggles going on you know they've had a huge um, uh, workload and you've also had the World Cup some have been away some have been not and you've got this cramming of games in over the over from now until the end of the season where an international break comes. But you have to bear in mind that there's a huge amount of players going away on international duty. So you've got a split in the camp where you've got half a squad, you're ticking around in training, trying to do some work and realise you've lost your centre-half, your right-back, your left-back, your goalkeeper, your middle-of-the-park um, players. So training is... You can't really do an awful lot of functional training. You're just doing individual stuff. So... Um, you know, and then then again, you you go away and you think you've you're having a rest, and th three of your international players come back with strains and knocks, and no, that's, that's that's what we're praying to not happen. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I have to so, wait yeah. and see what you just throw throwing the balls up, see what happens. Yeah, yeah. In terms of um, transfers, obviously <clears throat> far away from where we are right now, but Declan Rice is someone who's been linked heavily with Arsenal. West Ham are going to ask for possibly upwards of 100 million. Do you think there's any chance of Arsenal paying that? Or are they going to come in at sort of 60 million and try and find a figure that works for both? 
I don't think they're paying 100 million. Mm. Um, I don't think he's worth 100 million, to be honest with you. I yeah. think West Ham are going to go, I want what we want more than that. Yeah, as you said. Um, do you I see think, a deal being done at all, or do you think Arsenal will look elsewhere? Someone like Moses Caicedo. Yeah, I like Caicedo. Um, I think the Brighton model, what they've done and what they're doing with their replacement of their players that they're sell- selling is brilliant. I'm a big admirer of, of what Brighton are all about, um, and he certainly fits into that to come in, and I think he's a really good player. I think if I'm not... I, I don't know who they're looking at, Um but I think probably Arteta's, the way that they've recruited so far, you would suggest that they've got alternatives um, and uh, and maybe the rice is a bit of a smoke screen and they're not really uh, interested. I don't know. So I don't know. I, I, I'm i not sure that he will, uh, I'm not sure he will be an Arsenal next season. Yeah, I suppose uh, a lot of negotiations to be done to decide what happens. Obviously, we talked earlier about Bukayo Saka not getting much chance for a rest and Martinelli on the other side. Arsenal need a, a backup for, for Saka, you'd say. Is there anyone that's, that's caught your eye that perhaps they should be looking at? Um, God. I think when you, well, I think Reese Nelson's mm. uh, been a real asset to, to the squad, certainly from that goal point of view. But I think... Um, and I think I'm not. I don't. I don't know. See, summer, summer wise, I presume. I presume they'll be looking somewhere in a wide area. But I think Trossard ticks that box in as much as they've just signed another winger forward. Yeah. Um, and whether Reese Nelson goes on and, and carries on getting better in that position, I don't know whether. I think. I think the striker role is is possibly a little bit. Um, more needed. Um, winger point of view. Well, obviously they went for Mudrick anyway. So whether Trossard's cancelled that out or they're going, they'll go again. I don't know. But it, as I said, the Kios, Sometimes when you've got see Ray, Ray was the same. We never signed anybody really to replay. Ray just kind of you just keep playing, and it was like. All oh, right, and they've got Sylvan Biltord came in, mm-hmm. and then he was like he could play all along anywhere along the front line. So he yeah. was he was a brilliant addition. I think certainly yeah. players in this system that they play, um, it 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 warrants somebody who's very versatile in that role and, and being able to do an out and out winger doesn't doesn't fit into the to Arteta's way of playing. Yeah. Saw that with Pepe, I suppose, didn't we? Really kind of um, almost Saka came through and took his place and then yeah. there was nowhere left for him to go. Yeah. Um, Moussa Diaby at Leverkusen is kind of a, a pace. pace yeah. you know, he's been linked to Arsenal, but is that something that you don't really see? As- uh, I've not seen enough of him to... Um, I've seen him play, um, but I've not seen enough of him to go, oh, he looks like an, a, an Arsenal player. I was with Edu last night at the London Football World to try to get out of him who we were looking at, but he wasn't giving anything away. <laughs> yeah, really? Okay. Keep it, keeping it under his hand. I'm going out for dinner with him in a couple of weeks. We've got an Arsenal reunion dinner and he's going on it, so I'm going to make sure I get seat, seated next to him. <laughs> yeah, good tactics. Then. <laughs> Getting his ear a bit. Fair enough. Um, in terms of players coming through the Arsenal Hale End Academy, the youth system, uh, Ethan Nwery was the obviously the youngest player to ever play in the Premier League, but now he's being supposedly eyed up by Chelsea and Man City. How important is it that Arsenal tie him down to a new contract, do you think? Well, yeah, I think all the any any of the young boys that are showing any there's a whole there's a whole process of of firstly finding talent, keeping talent, giving talent a pre, a, a pathway to first team. And Bikayo, obviously, um, and that that type of pathway that that he's shown, and and if you can if you can get that right, and that's the structure of that is is not as easy as it sounds, you know, because as you said, at any point, Joe, if there's a break in any of that process, then and a player can can move somewhere else or be pinched by somebody else, then you've spent all that money and and it basically goes out the back door. So. Um, but what it does, we've seen that with Bikayo, is 
and you could tell, you could see it last night when he was getting his award and he gave a speech and the actual identity of him as an Arsenal uh, player was just shines through and through. And you get the benefit of that ability to be able to keep players up until first team and then progress them into the first team. It gives them a grounding and a, and a loyalty that you, it, that never leaves you. You know, there's a, the, I, I was lucky enough that I got there early enough in my career. I'd done all, I'd treaded all the balls in the lower leagues and managed to build myself up and get myself. And I was 23 and I was there till I was 38. And those, I saw from the, the youngsters that were below me or had been there since apprenticeships, the David Rowcastles, the Michael Thomases, the Paul Davis, the Kevin Campbells, their their the identity and connection to the club was like, wow, I, I want I want some of that. Mm-hmm. I because I'd not had that. I'd been, you know, I'd been released three times as a youngster. So I didn't really have anybody to any club to latch on to. Yeah. And even though I was 23, it, I it enabled me having watched those grow up and grew and, and watching them get into the first team. It really made me almost like I'd done the same. And I went that. So I I connected myself to Arsenal at a later age at 23, and that's why it's in my blood now mm-hmm. to talk about them and feel as if I was there all my career. And that's not forgetting where I was before. It's just, and I think that. When you see the, you know, that's the importance of what you're talking about is is being able to tie those players in, and go, this is a this is a big family, and you're staying here for a long time, and this is what you get when you do what Bakayo's done, and I think he's a huge role role model for all those kids. You talk about Hale End that he can go down, and he will do because he's that type of, you know, um, Smith Rowe, and all the, all those guys can share their experience in Ketia and and share what they can get at the end of it. Stepping into that first team dressing room is, is a huge thing for these kids. That's right. I suppose once you, once they can see the path, they can. Yeah. Sort of well, that's what, that's what, um, you know, to be fair on a, a, an international level, that's what Gareth's done with England is mm-hmm. enabled the, all the, the lads coming through the, the, uh, the age groups to actually see a pathway into the first team. It's been, uh, and that's why they've had the success they've had. Um, quick question about Arsenal's rivals for the title, Manchester City. Obviously, Pep Guardiola's trying to fight out on, on three fronts. He's got the FA Cup, the Champions League and the Premier League. Yeah. Do you, do you feel he's kind of coming to the end of his 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 love affair with City? If they don't <coughs> win the Champions League, don't win the Premier League this season, can you see him going off and managing elsewhere or having another sabbatical possibly? Oh, good. Good luck just trying to work out what's going on in Pet's yeah. head. Um, <laughs> yeah. He, uh, well, he, he he knocked that ball out of the park when he's, you know, the, the three years at, at, at all his other clubs, and you know, at Barcelona and Real Madrid, mm-hmm. at um, Bayern Munich, and then he's not going to stay more than three years at at City. And and uh, and I, I think he's found, I say, he's found a home. The Premier League seems to be the place that he, he, it calls home now. Um, with him, I, I, I don't know. I don't really know what's going on in his head. I still think he's got the passion to, and the Champions League uh, target and uh, the lure of that m- may keep him going for, you know, lo- longer than he's than he should do. I don't know. Um, he, he definitely that's a, a, an unticked box for him for sure, um, as far as Man City's concerned, and. Uh, you know, you might be. We might be talking in. Uh, you know, we're doing another interview after the season's over, and we might be talking about. Well, Pep won the league and he won the Champions League this year. What What does that mean? You know, because it, it, it that's hugely possible, based on what we've seen of Man City and how capable they are of. Albeit they've they've fallen over the Champions League hurdle quite a few times, but anything's possible with him and and his players because of the extraordinary um, ability to win football matches. Yeah, I mean, I'd gladly let them have the Champions League as long as they, <laughs> they let us have the Premier League away and see. Yeah, yeah but like, of, um, Obviously, um, match the day's back this week with pundits and with commentary. Are you pleased, pleased to see that? Yeah, not talking about Lineker, so next question. No, no, I'm asking about Lineker. It's just, no, I'm, just, glad, I'm, glad he's, I'm glad he's back, although I did quite enjoy the 20 minutes of no talk. Yeah. 
that's quite surreal, wasn't it? Just crowd noises. I quite enjoyed yeah. it as well. You could just like match the day two, you could just hear the Arsenal fans singing away and uh yeah, yeah. it was it was it was uh it was a novelty when it first came on, but then after about after the first game was over, I was like, Well, I need to I need to hear something now. Yeah, and, yeah, it was almost like it went too quickly, wasn't it? It was like yeah, 20 it's, minutes. It's, it's, it's good that it's good that they're all back. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, moving on from that though. Uh, do you think Arsenal should ask Gareth Southgate to to ensure that Bukayo Saka doesn't play ninety minutes in both of England's matches next week, or is that just <coughs> risking the? Yeah, risk, I, I don't think the there's any harm in. I don't think there's any harm in asking. Um, but with that, you have to have the knowledge that Gareth Southgate is well in his rights to turn around and say. You can shove that where the sun they are, Yeah, they're, they're not friendly, are they? They're qualifiers. So yeah, yeah. so I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't expect anything. And uh, and uh, but I, I'm sure, you know, Gareth's. Uh, I, I'm a good mate with Gareth, and and he's a really lovely fella. And but he's very very passionate about how England do, and quite rightly so. So and Arteta understands that. He knows. I'm sure there's a little bit of. Um, give and take here and there and if he's got a knock or he's got something they'll try and uh ease him into whatever training sessions and they're not they're not fools they've got a, a brilliant setup gareth at england and they won't you know they won't flog him they, they'll be very wary of the minutes he's played at arsenal they're all over everything they you know that it, it's not taken that you just get a player like when i was playing and you you kind of just go about your work as if nothing else exists. There, there is an interaction between the clubs and and the FA, and and certainly Gareth's a, an intelligent boy, and he'll he'll know exactly how to deal with uh, Bukayo and uh, and Arteta for, for that matter. And I'm sure they'll they'll have some sort of dialogue. Yeah, I, I hope so as well. Okay, one final question, um, just about VAR. Since Howard Webb's taken over um, from Mike Riley, have you seen any improvements in the the handling of VAR? Oh gosh! Um, <laughs> or not? Well, the 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 easy answer to that is no. <laughs> yeah. um, it's I I am a fan of. I'm kind of a fan, and I'm not a fan. I, there's lots of occasions where I go, "That's what VAR's for," and I think those moments it 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 kind of cements the view in my head that it's good for the game, but then within the next highlights thing on match of the day that we're going to get this weekend, there'll be another incident where I go, well, it's just ludicrous. You know, the, the Casemiro sending off and then the, the, the tattle the day before in the Leicester game. And, and you're like, hang on a minute. Same, same person was involved. And it was, how does it is one week it's a mockery and the next week it's saving the game. So Mm. I, I'm probably, equally as confused about it as I was before Howard Webb took over. So <laughs> a long way to go, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just don't know why we're making it so complicated. Mm-hmm. It seemed like it seemed, I don't know. I don't live in Germany. I don't live in other countries. I don't live in, wherever VAR is active. Are they, you know, somebody tell me, are they having the same chaos as us? <laughs> With the handball rule. I don't remember it being so confused at the World Cup. But in the I, Premier I, just, I, I don't. I, I honestly playing the game. If I was a player now, I, I would, I would not know where I'm supposed to put my hands, what I'm supposed to do with them. Honestly. You know, even putting your hands behind the back nowadays, which I hate, by the way, mm-hmm. putting your hands behind the back is is deemed as handball or whatever. Because yeah. I mean, to me, if it hits your hand when your hand's behind the back, that should be handball because that's not a natural position for your hand to be in. That's a valid point, yeah. I know. So just arms down by your side, that's the only natural position for your hands, they're trying to say, I don't know. I but, don't know. but yeah, the, the Bournemouth defender, who the ball hit the back of his arm oh, and it, that's a penalty. Please, so. Come on. It's no. just, honestly, I, I, I've get, I kind of, and the bit, I mean, I commentate every weekend, so I'm, I'm faced with a different scenario virtually sometimes in the same game of of the handball situation and um and the one I did the Champions League Chelsea game and you know their penalty he's never a handball in a million years 
and 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 the, he's been sent over to by the VAR to look at the monitor on a on a on a handball that's subjective. So that's taking the complete reason of doing it out the way. If it's subjective, then why are you sending him over? Because it's only his opinion against yours upstairs. Yeah, it's not and clear and obvious error. No, absolutely. But anyway, yeah, that's far put to bed. <laughs>